So this time, um, I'll, I'll be talking about unsupervised and semi-supervised learning of structure. Um, so just, I think everybody knows this, but um, to, uh, to cover it anyway, um, most of the models that we've handled so far are using some sort of supervised learning. So supervised learning, we're given, um, uh, we want to model the probability of y given x, and at training time, we're given uh, both of these. Um, and sometimes we're interested in unsupervised learning. Um, so we want to model the probability of y given x, but at training time, we're given only x. Um, so uh, that means we kind of have to guess y uh, without having any annotations of y. And then semi-supervised learning, uh, it, we model this uh, p of y given x, and at training time, we're given both uh, we're either given both or we're given only x. Um, so I'm going to talk about the latter two of those today, mostly unsupervised learning, um, because mo most unsupervised learning methods can be easily applied to uh, semi-supervised learning. Um, but first, before I do so, I'd like to make a distinction. So um, learning features versus learning discrete structure. So um, up until now, we've uh, talked uh, quite a bit about learning features, like word or sentence embeddings. So this is like turning a sentence into a vector. And in this case, um, in this case, we're not, we're doing unsupervised learning. Like word to vec is unsupervised. We don't have any annotations of the vectors that we're learning. But we actually don't really care about the vectors either. Um, like we don't really... Um, we might look at kind of dimension reduced uh, versions of the vectors, but the reason why we want the vectors is because they're useful for some uh, for something some other task. Um, learning discrete structure, on the other hand, um, we have an English sentence and we want to learn some sort of structure over this English sentence. Um, and the reason why we might want to learn structure over the English sentence is to actually look at this structure and actually uh, analyze it or, uh, or something like that. Um, it might also be useful, um, or, so why discrete structure? The first one is we may want to, um, we may want to model, uh, model information flow differently. So let's say uh, we are using a tree structured neural network. Um, the tree structured neural network models the information flow through our, our sentences based on the structure. So we might want to do uh, something like that. And the second thing is that they're more interpretable. You can look at this tree and see whether uh, this tree tells you something about like the phrase structure of the sentence, et cetera. Um, so I've talked about a lot of different varieties of unsupervised feature learning up until now. So um, when, um, when we did unsupervised learning of embeddings or features for a particular sentence, um, we have an objective and use the intermediate uh, states of this objective uh, uh, that lead to, uh, that occur from us calculating the objective. So we have things like SIBO, where we have a continuous bag of words, and then we use the word embeddings. Uh, we also had the, uh, the skip gram objectives. Uh, we had sentence level autoencoder type things. Uh, so sentence level autoencoders would, you know, turn the sentence into a vector and then uh, try to re-output the sentence. We also had something like skip thought vectors, where basically we take in the sentence and then we try to predict the surrounding sentences. Um, and we had things like variational autoencoders, where we uh, we randomly uh, selected a uh, a sentence embedding. Uh, but we could also select it according to the inference model. Um, so everybody, I imagine, remembers all of these. But the important thing here is all of these are learning like a continuous vector representation uh, as opposed to learning uh, any sort of discrete structure. So how did we use these? Um, we could use them to solve tasks directly by, uh, by doing this um, kind of kings to king, queen, queens thing. Um, and by proxy, we can do knowledge base uh, completion, et cetera, uh, which can be solved in a couple classes. But I, one of the kind of interesting things here is, in a way, these methods by Miklov et al. are a really simple 
version of inducing discrete structure. From this word embedding space, they're inducing links between words. Um, so you can think of this as you're first inducing your features, then you're doing a super simple heuristic version of inducing the structure uh, between the words. Uh, and that's telling you things like man, man and woman are related, uncle and aunt are related, king and queen are related in the same way. Um, another thing that I think a lot of people have done on the assignment or research or whatever is to use these to initialize uh, downstream models. Um, so what are the kinds of discrete structure that we can induce? We can uh, do things like clustering words together. Um, that's not super interesting. Uh, another thing we can do is we can cluster words in context. Um, this is more interesting. So this could be the basic idea of this would be like part of speech tagging, uh, for example, or if you wanted to do named entity recognition, you could also do it this way. Um, or we can learn structure like parse trees or something. And I'm going to talk about all of these uh, in the next one. Um, it's a little bit of a, a, a strange or a, a title that might be easily misinterpreted. Um, <laughs> when I say objective here, I mean objective in the machine learning sense. So what is our, what is our loss function? What is the thing that we optimize here? And almost always, it's some sort of kind of generative model of the data X. So if we induce good structures, um, we will be able to generate the data X with high probability. If we induce bad structures, we won't be able to generate the data X. So um, we're, it's an idea very similar to the idea behind the variational autoencoder, um, which is if we find a good latent representation, uh, we'll be able to generate the X easily. Um, except in this case, our latent representation is a discrete structure instead of a continuous vector. Um, there's a bunch, or there's a couple different ways to do this. Um, the kind of traditional way of doing this is we, um, we factorize our problem into uh, PY, which is where PY is kind of our, uh, our model of the discrete structures that we want to induce. And then P of X given Y is our, uh, our model of actually producing those, uh, the data. Another way uh, this is sometimes factorized is P of, uh, P of Y given X multiplied by P of X given Y. And this is kind of like our autoencoder, uh, our autoencoder type objective. Um, to make this kind of mathematically correct and into a nice generative model, uh, we can use the variational autoencoder, uh, which is instead of coming up with P of Y given X, instead we get, uh, we get Q, of, uh, Q of Y given X, um, in which case uh, this basically, according to the equations, turns into the one above and turns into a, a nice uh, generative model. Um, okay, so that's kind of the background, um, and then I'll give a bunch of concrete examples uh, of each of these. Are there any questions about this so far? No? So, um, the, one of the interesting things was um, this kind of unsupervised induction of structure was actually quite popular up until 2014. Uh, and everybody knows what happened in 2014. Suddenly neural networks took over. And then uh, for two or three years, everybody was doing supervised learning um, because supervised learning is easy to do with neural networks. And there were so many kind of like low hanging fruit uh, type things that you can use to, uh, you can use neural networks to improve your uh, accuracy on. Um, but there's a, a very rich literature in unsupervised and semi-supervised learning for uh, kind of non-neural methods. Um, and I have a interesting reading material, not required reading material for, uh, for this class. So we didn't, I didn't ask you to do it for the quiz. But if you look at the website, um, Noah Smith's uh, 
linguistic structure prediction, I think, is, is the name of the book. And chapter four is all about uh, the unsupervised methods before that. I won't cover these methods. I'm only going to cover methods that use neural networks here. But you can take a look at that if you want to know a whole bunch of uh, other things that people have used unsupervised learning for. Um, so that being said, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, neural network-based methods. So clustering words in context, as I said, um, the kind of prototypical example of this is part of speech induction. So uh, given a particular word, what do we think it's part of speech is? Um, so a first attempt that we can do uh, to cluster words is to cluster words out of context and just cluster them all together. So each word falls into a single, uh, into a single cluster. Um, and this is as simple as training word embeddings and then performing k-means clustering uh, on top of them. This is so simple that I think nobody has ever written a paper about it. I tried to find one. <laughs> I tried to find one, but I wasn't able to find uh, a paper that did this seriously. Maybe somebody else knows one, but um, but this is uh, implemented in word even though they never wrote a paper about this uh, in word um, And word has this classes option, where if you do classes uh, 20, it will group your, your word vectors into 20 classes for you. Um, so, so yeah, so the reason why this is less interesting is Clustering words together um, may be good. Uh, it was really effective before we started using neural networks. But now that we have neural networks, neural networks can take in distributed representations where each vector kind of gives you a different aspect of the word. So it's really not as necessary to cluster things together anymore just to raise the accuracy of your neural network. Um, so you will probably get more. Um, you'll probably get more benefit if you uh, if you do it in a kind of contextual way. You'll probably get a, more benefit if you do it for the purpose of um, for the purpose of essentially analyzing your data and coming up with uh, uh, clusters. So one good example of that is part of speech tags. You might want to know which words tend to be which part of speech and uh, kind of cluster patterns together or something like that. So the, the way we do this, um, which I think most people who took uh, neural, um, algorithms for NLP probably, uh, I think you covered a, a HMM-based part of speech tagger there, is basically um, you can create a factored model of uh, P of X given Y and PY, where PY is basically uh, a state-to-state -state transition probability over all of the um, over all of the part of speech tags, and uh, when you calculate the probability of the next part of speech tag, um, you use the previous part of speech tag. So it's an order one uh, order one Markov uh, chain. Um, then you also have your emission probabilities, which is the probability of emitting natural uh, given. Uh, given JJ. Oh, whoops, there's a typo there. That should be, uh, this, the second two emission probability should be NN, not JJ. Uh, so, uh, sorry, that's a, that's a mistake. Um, so unsupervised hidden Markov models, basically what you do is instead of taking named classes, um, what you can do is you can just say, give me 20, 20 states, 30 states, and I want you to automatically find, like allocate each of these words to a state uh, in order to maximize this probability. Um, and it's exactly the same. You can parameterize these by, uh, by categorical distributions where you basically count the number of times 17 has generated language and divide by the number of times you've seen 17 and, uh, and calculate this uh, probability. And these can be trained using the forward-backward algorithm. So we talked about CRFs uh, before. CRFs use something uh, called the forward-backward algorithm to calculate the probability of seeing each uh, each feature. Uh, you do exactly the same thing with uh, with HMMs. In fact, these were developed for HMMs in the first place. So this is this is algorithms for NLP, no neural components whatsoever. Um, but 
Interestingly, you can convert this into something that maybe, maybe it's not exactly a neural network, but at least uses word embeddings that were learned using a neural network. And the idea is instead of parameterizing each state with a categorical distribution, um, we can use a Gaussian uh, or a Gaussian mixture for each state. So in other words, each state has its own mean vector and covariance matrix. And uh, uh, we can calculate Gaussian probabilities uh, based on this. And each time uh, we emit a particular word from the state, uh, we calculate the probability density function, or we calculate the probability density for our word embedding, and we use that as our, our uh, probability of emitting things. And the funny thing is this was for an extremely long time, the de facto standard for speech, I think maybe 20 or 20 or 30 years. I don't know when like HTK came out, but I think it was 20 years at least. Um, but really nobody had re applied this to text because text, we don't have continuous variables in text. Uh, so the paper here uh, by Linda uh, simply took the thing that people use in speech forever and, uh, and ran it over um, part of speech induction. Um, and they, they got uh, relatively good results for this. So um, it's a super simple application of existing technology. But uh, now that we have words in continuous space, this is, uh, this is something that we can do. Um, any, any questions about this? OK. Um, so uh, this is a paper from one year after that uh, by Tron et al. And they took this a, a little bit farther. Um, so basically the idea here is that instead of, um, instead of having fixed word embeddings that you just treat as um, uh, yeah, instead of having embeddings that you just treat as fixed and run your normal Markov model over it, we actually do want to learn the embeddings um, to, in a way that allow, uh, helps us to optimize our probability uh, in emissions and stuff like that. So um, this, the idea here is basically we take the emission and trans, uh, transition probabilities, and we calculate these uh, with a neural network. So the probabilities themselves are calculated with a neural network, but then after you calculate the probabilities with the neural network, you use the, the normal forward-backward algorithm uh, to basically calculate your potential functions and then update the neural network's parameters. So in a way, this is very, very similar to the neural CRF uh, that we talked about before. Um, so the way they calculate their potential functions is basically um, we take in a, uh, an embedding for the tags, um, and then we run this through a, uh, a nonlinearity. And then we, um, we calculate the probabilities of, um, of all the tags. And then we take the dot product of the tags with the word embeddings. Um, and the word embeddings can be calculated according to something like a character CNN. So just to give a little bit of intuition why this is a good idea, um, what we're doing is for each word, um, for each tag we have an embedding, for each word we have an embedding. And then we're taking the dot product of them. So Tag embeddings for similar tags, like verb, for example, uh, verb present tense, verb past tense, verb, uh, verb present progressive tense, or something like that, may all have a few, like a few parts that are similar, um, and a few parts that are different. Um, then the word embedding, this can <coughs> consider the spelling of the word. So this um, could do stuff like detect whether the, the end of the word is ing. 
uh, or, or something else like that. And, um, <coughs> and because uh, you can detect the word, the end of the word is ing, um, then uh, you have a pretty good idea that it's going to be a, a verb or something. Um, so by doing this, you can basically generalize over your words a little bit better than you could before. And actually, uh, Taylor uh, Berg Kirkpatrick uh, here had a very nice paper that did this uh, before neural networks came out, and they cited it. So you can go back and look at that uh, as well. But there you had to hand, hand engineer a whole bunch of, uh, of spelling features, et cetera. And this is basically leaving everything to a neural network. Um, the second thing, I'm actually not entirely sure about this. Um, uh, but basically, the idea is you calculate your transition matrix um, based on an, uh, on an LSTM over the words that you've already generated. Um, I'm actually not sure if this is so correct or not, because it essentially breaks the Markov assumption that you, uh, that you have in your hidden Markov model. So it just becomes like a hidden model. Um, uh, but uh, they, they did this, and it, it seems to work. So um, uh, the idea is basically you can emit this transition matrix for every time step, and, uh, and then use this instead, and then run the forward backward. Algorithm, et um, any questions about that? Yeah. Yes. Uh, they didn't do a backward LSTM because then it wouldn't be a generative model. Yeah. Um, okay. So there's also a kind of uh, a kind of neat paper. Um, this is called CRF autoencoders, and it it actually doesn't really have any neural components in the paper itself, despite the name autoencoder. Um, but it's essentially trivial to apply a neural network to this model. So I thought I'd introduce it anyway. Um, so basically, this is like, uh, like the HMM approach that I explained before, but it's more principled and flexible. The idea is basically that you predict potential functions for the tags. Um, and then kind of do dynamic programming over the tags, but then you use the tags to generate the, um, you use the tags to, to regenerate the, um, the output. So the idea here is we have an encoder part and we have a decoder part um, where the encoder part is basically it's, um, you can look at the whole input and you can c calculate the potential for each tag. Then you have connections between each of the tags uh, with first order Markov assumptions. And then from these tags, you generate the words. Um, you generate the words. So this is, um, it's basically a CRF. And the CRF is trained so that from the tags, you can generate the words. But like a regular autoencoder, like the idea of the original autoencoder is you're taking this big sentence you're compressing it into this little tiny vector that can't have as much information as the original sentence. Mm -hmm. And then you're trying to regenerate the sentence. So you need to compress very well in order for it to be successful. The same idea applies here. Uh, here, you're taking a whole sentence with lots of rich information and compressing it into a tag sequence that loses a lot of the information. And then you need to regenerate the sentence there. So in a way, it's very similar. It's an autoencoder. Uh, type thing, uh, very similar, but uh, a little bit different. Um, so these are all very, very beautiful methods. I thought I should just um, give one very quick mention of that people were thinking about similar things as early as 1992. Um, what they did here was uh, significantly less elegant, but probably would work pretty well, which is you First, train an RNN according to a standard loss function, like language modeling or whatever else. Um, and then you cluster the hidden states according to k-means. So this is like what's implemented in word to vec uh, The only difference is that um, word to vec only calculates a single vector for a word, but this calculates a vector in context for the word. So um, each... Uh, this, the hidden state will be different uh, for each word just because uh, it's also looking at the other words in the sentence. Um, oh, yeah, and sorry, I forgot one thing, which is uh, 
you can actually draw kind of like a, a finite state acceptor that uh, that then steps through uh, um, uh, these uh, state transitions that you get this way, which you can do with the other uh, methods as well. Um, and any questions about any of these? Or? I think these are good if you want to like uncover interpretable dynamics uh, of something like a conversation or, or a document or uh, whatever. So the, these would be good uh, good things to look at there. Yeah. Yeah. With regard to so so like unlike a uh, like the the hidden I mean the word embeddings mm -hmm. the like hidden stages of the RNA or like memory cell or whatever like can be like, different by the depends on the words yep. the syntax, right? mm -hmm. then how can this like clustering wizards are like like I mean can be observed because mm -hmm. depending on the which context the words has mm -hmm. it's totally different right oh so you can look at the you can look at the clustering results um, by uh, you know just sentence by sentence um, if you remember, maybe in the second or third class um, on word embeddings that I did here, I showed a keyword in context graph where basically you you take a particular word and you look at all the surrounding um, uh, things there. You could do that for a tag and kind of see what contexts that tag appears in and you know then hopefully interpret it. There's a similar problem in interpreting topic models. Uh, so if you know if you know anything about topic models, basically, topic models also induce a distribution over uh, over words. So you could probably also list up the the top words that tend to be generated by that state and see uh, see what they are or something like that. So um, if you have a good answer, you can uh, <laughs> you can tell me later. Also, um, anything else? No. Okay, um, so now I'll talk about things that are maybe a little bit more interesting, which is unsupervised phrase structured composition functions. Um, I, so unfortunately I've been planning on talking about this all class, but then Sam Bowman talked about this very well <laughs> during our colloquium. So some of it might be semi-repetitive, but I'll explain it in my own way. So, uh, so hopefully it will be uh, a little bit different. And I have a few things that he didn't talk about here. Um, but basically, um, we have soft versus hard tree structure. Um, so a soft tree structure is using some sort of differentiable gating function um, that induces something that looks like a tree, um, where the gating function is in kind of a tree structure. Um, then hard tree structure is non-differentiable. Um, Probably the main advantage of the first one, I forgot to write the advantage of the first one. The advantage of the first one is like everything else in neural networks for NLP, if we don't have to make discrete decisions, we don't want to make discrete decisions because it will make our training harder. So having a gating function um, will allow us to train our model using backpropagation without making discrete decisions. On the other hand, sometimes you really do need to make discrete decisions to model the thing that you want to model. Um, and some, one example of that would be uh, you might want a more complicated composition function that, uh, that you just can't easily do uh, if you're not modeling discrete decisions. Um, so hard tree structure looks like this. Um, it's the tree you're used to seeing. And soft tree structure basically looks something like this, where you could say this is a right branching tree with a probability of 0 0.8, a left branching tree with a probability of 0 0.8. Um, so, <coughs> any uh, questions? No. Okay. Another thing that I should talk about is I, I mentioned uh, unsupervised, semi-supervised, and uh, supervised, unsupervised, semi-supervised learning. Um, one other name that you'll probably hear frequently and probably have heard already and uh, for many people is weak supervision. Um, it's a little bit uh, it's a little bit confusing uh, with all the terminology, but basically, sur supervised um, given we're given x and y to model p of y given x. Unsupervised, we're given x to model this, 
And weakly supervised, we're given x and v to model uh, p of y given x under the supervision that y and v share some sort of information. Um, so this is uh, one example of this in, uh, that I'll, I'll show in a second is we're given um, text and we're given a, uh, a label about sentiment or we're given a label about natural language inference and then we want to induce a tree structure. We want to find a tree structure. Um, so in that case, x would be our text, v would be our label, with, um, and then we have a tree structure, uh, y, where um, we hope that uh, the label somehow is influenced by the tree structure in an appropriate way. Actually, maybe, um, maybe machine translation is a, better, is a better example. So in machine translation, we assume that there's some sort of uh, structure in text that influences our reordering um, between words, and if we get that structure correct, we'll get our machine translation results more correct. So, um, so in that case, x would be uh, text in one language, v would be text in another language, and then y would be our y would be our tree structure. Um, this is different from multitask or transfer learning uh, because we aren't given any y. We basically y is entirely unsupervised. Um, but, uh, so it's different from that. Um, it's also different from supervised learning with latent variables because we actually care about the intermediate representation. Um, so in other words, if we're trying to induce tree structure from sentiment labels, we actually care, if we actually care about our tree structure, it, that is weakly supervised learning. If we actually care about our sentiment labels, that's supervised learning with latent variables. So that's kind of the distinction uh, there. Um, there's also a name distance supervision. Um, as far as I know, distance supervision and weak supervision are the same thing. Um, if anybody has written a paper about distance supervision and wants to get angry at me, that's uh, <laughs> that's okay, but I, I can't I can't tell the difference between the two, so I think they're they're the same. Um, any objections? No. Okay. <laughs> um, cool. So first, I'll talk about a model of um, of soft uh, soft tree structure called the gated convolution model. Um, this model was uh, proposed in one of the early papers on machine translation. And basically, it's a, gate, it's a model with a gating function um, where you can choose to either use the left node or the right node or a combination of the two nodes. So this is what the gating function looks like. Um, you can either choose the left or the right or the middle, and you make a soft decision between these. Um, so this induces a, a tree structure uh, or something that kind of looks like a tree structure. The way to interpret this graph is Obama is the president of the United States is on the bottom. And any arrow that you see in here is where the gating function has a probability of over 0 0.1. So it's any place where the probability of the gating function was a reasonably high number. Uh, so does this look like a tree? No. <laughs> Yeah, it doesn't look like a tree at all. So basically, this is a failure. In, <laughs> this is a failure in terms of inducing trees. Uh, it's not a failure because it's one of the first papers on neural machine translation, which uh, has had a huge effect uh, other than that. But um, interestingly, it also talked about this. This was trained using a loss function for machine translation, obviously, as I said. So um, they uh, you could view this as kind of a... Um, a, a supervised model with latent variables where they actually cared about MT more than they cared about their trees. Um, so the next one, um, uh, learning with uh, reinforcement learning. Uh, this is by uh, Yogatama et al. Uh, quite recently. Um, so this is the common thread that you see in a lot of the things I've talked about in the past like four classes, which is we have some sort of discrete decision uh, that we want to make, but we can't, uh, we can't make it without breaking back props, so we use reinforcement learning. Um, so we have an intermediate uh, tree-structured representation for 
I said language modeling, but it's actually, sorry, it's for encoding sentences. Um, and then we predict that tree using shift-reduced parsing. Um, and then the sentence representation is composed in a tree-structured uh, manner using a, uh, a tree-structured composition function. Um, I, talk, I have talked about a whole bunch of tree-structured composition functions, including the regular recursive neural network, the tree LSTM, uh, the bidirectional LSTM over, uh, over uh, children and stuff like that. And you could theoretically use any of these. I actually forget exactly which one they used here. Um, I'll have to go back and look that up. Um, so yeah, reinforcement learning with a, a prediction loss. And the specific way they modeled, uh, they modeled this was through a shift reduce uh, type style uh, thing. So they only have two actions. Uh, one action is shift, one action is reduce. And based on that, you'll get a different tree structure. Um, one really clever thing about this paper is, as I repeated over and over again, reinforcement learning is, is hard. And reinforcement learning is especially hard when you have a big action space. Um, so the clever thing about this paper is their action space is super small. It's two. Uh, it's shift or reduce. Um, so this is about the, the level of complexity that you can be confident that uh, you'll be able to learn uh, through reinforcement learning. Um, Things, you can still learn things that get bigger than this, but, uh, but they did a good job of reducing their, uh, their problem to a small action space. Um, so this is a, another uh, paper um, that was also talked about in Sam Bowman's talk, but this is a nice, uh, a nice paper. Um, so the idea here is choosing uh, one parent at each layer um, and you reduce the uh, reduce the size of uh, the layer uh, or the the length of the sentence by one. So you start out with a layer that is the cat sat on, um, and basically of all of these, which two look like they should be combined together with the highest probability? Which two uh, words kind of look the best thing, like the best thing to combine together? Um, and actually, this has a couple parallels in the parsing literature. Um, this is, there's a method called easy first parsing, where basically you try to combine together, you try to get the, um, the easiest dependency edge to combine together first. And in a way, you can kind of think of this as the neural unsupervised version of easy first parsing, where instead of doing dependency parsing, you're doing phrase structure parsing. <laughs> um, so then you're combining, uh, you're combining the easiest thing together first, and you get uh, something like the cat sat on, the cat sat on, and then you continue doing this until you have a binary tree all the way up. Um, this was uh, trained, instead of train, training using reinforcement learning, they trained it using the Gumbel, uh, the Gumbel straight through uh, reparameterization trick. Um, so, that might make it a little bit more stable. This is, this may be faster and more efficient than the, uh, than the version uh, by Yogatama et al. Um, and it seems to get better results. Um, I'm not, uh, these are very recent papers, so it's kind of hard to draw uh, a conclusion uh, immediately, but this seems to be a promising method. And, um, also, Williams et al. Uh, find that this gives less trivial trees, so it's binary branching trees instead of like only right branching trees, for example. Um, any questions about those or discussion? Okay. So next, I'll talk about learning uh, learning dependency structures. So all of the ones up until here. You can kind of view them as learning something like phrase structure uh, trees. But there's also methods on um, learning uh, dependency structures. So previous methods have attempted to kind of learn representations of frees, uh, um, or the previous methods uh, were phrase structure, and now we want to do dependency structure. And there is this. Um, there's this method called the dependency model with valence. Have, has anybody heard of this before? Oh, quite a, quite a few people, uh, or a few people. 
Um, so this method is by Dan Klein and Chris Manning, who are now kind of uh, very famous people in the field of NLP. Um, and it's a very clever model. And it was very long, the baseline that you tried to beat by a little bit uh, when you did dependency parsing. Because you couldn't beat it by a lot because it worked really well. Um, but the basic idea is it's a generative model. Um, it's a language model over dependencies um, where uh, basically you generate top down. Uh, you generate the sentence top down by generating the root first and then generating its children on either side. Um, and for both the right and left side, calculate whether to can you continue generating words and then if yes, you generate. So a, an example for the word saw is, um, is the generative process is like this. So saw, um, you can see on its left side it has I. On its right side it has girl and telescope as its children. So um, on the left side you generate continue, uh, conditioned on saw left and false, where false is whether you've generated something already or not. Um, then you generate I. Um, then you generate a uh, stop to say I'm, I'm done generating children. And then, sorry, um, my slides are wrong again. These should all be right, right arrows. So change, change all of those into right arrows. But um, uh, so then on the right side, you generate uh, continue, girl, continue with, and then stop uh, like this. Um, this model is really nice because um, like, uh, like the HMM's forward-backward algorithm, you can do dynamic programming in this to you know, uh, directly calculate these probabilities. Um, there is a paper that uh, basically used neural nets to calculate the dependency model with valence. And the idea is simple. Uh, parameterize the decision with neural nets instead of count-based uh, distributions in like the DMV uh, train with the EM algorithm. So they have uh, a figure in their paper uh, where basically it says the normal DMV is the green dotted line here and the, the neural DMV is the red line where you also do neural network training to basically update these parameters. Um, so you might notice this is exactly the same thing as the neural uh, HMM. It's exactly the same concept where basically you're taking in a neural network, and you're um, you're calculating the parameters of a model that used to be calculated based on just discrete distributions. So maybe the lesson here is if you have some neat unsupervised model that you want to learn from uh, the pre-neural era, you create a neural network to calculate its parameters, and uh, and then question mark question mark question mark profit, uh, <laughs> and you get a you get a paper out of it. So. Um, but I, I think it's a good first step for a lot of these models, especially because the dynamic programming models tend to be very stable uh, and uh, good at learning these things. Um, so um, I, uh, this is a paper that I'm a co-author on, um, but I, I think it's a kind of neat paper if you're interested in like examining models to, uh, to figure about, out a little bit more about linguistics. But um, as I said, dependencies are basically trying to induce which word is the head, um, which word is the head uh, of uh, of other other words. And the idea here, it's not a completely unsupervised model. It actually requires that we have a phrase structure parse. But given a phrase structure tree, um, we want to figure out which child in the tree is the head word. Um, or which child in the phrase is a head word. And basically, um, the general idea of a head in linguistics is that it's the most important word in the phrase. It's the, the word that kind of dictates the syntax um, and or semantics of the phrase. Um, so the idea is we create a phrase composition function that uses attention. So because we're using attention, we can basically induce uh, weights for each of the words in the phrase. And then we can examine if the attention weights follow the heads defined by linguistics. And we have some examples. These are probably really hard to see. Uh, but for example, we have Canadian Auto Workers Union President. Um, 
uh, this is a noun phrase where things are spread out uh, very um, kind of in a very uh, flat way. Um, but if we have other things like um, uh, the final hour, hour gets most of the attention weight. Um, we have Apple, Compaq, and IBM. Apple gets most of the attention weight. So um, you can kind of examine whether this matches. And we have qu quantitative results about whether this matches or not. And we also have examples from uh, uh, verb phrases. The verb phrases are a little bit more consistently the verb, but sometimes it, it, it is not. Uh, so, for example, uh, um, to, uh, to do something, uh, instead of focusing on the verb, which normally would be the head, it actually focuses on to, uh, which, is, which is not normally the head. But, um, it's a way of I inspecting things. Um, any questions about uh, anything in that section? Okay, um, I'll finish up with, uh, with two other examples. Neither of them were big enough to warrant a, sesh, a section on their own. Um, this is another paper in, that follows in the general line of, like, of inspecting attention to try to get you something uh, interpretable. Um, so the idea is super simple. Um, if we have an unsegmented language like Chinese or Japanese or uh, maybe an unwritten language where we have a transcription but we don't know the word boundaries of the, of the transcript, we might want to segment uh, those languages into words. So um, the simple idea, we train a neural MT system and then we extract uh, words where the attention uh, um, falls on consecutive uh, places. So this is an example uh, from a language called Mboshi uh, to French. Um, and you can see here uh, that it does seem to be uh, basically extracting attention weights that seem to be consistent with the, uh, with the word segmentations here. Um, and the red boxes are the true uh, word segmentations for the language, and the, uh, and the black boxes are the attention weights. And you can see it kind of over segments, but it, it does a reasonably good job. Um, and this is just using a heuristic method where um, if two things have the highest attention weight next to each other, they're treated as a single word. Um, then there's a more interesting but much more complicated method that was uh, proposed at, um, at EMNLP this year. Um, and this is kind of using the very um, traditional and correct way of doing things. It's uh, uh, doing segmentation um, with a reconstruction loss and reinforcement learning. So it's the way uh, that you can kind of uh, come up with here. Um, the idea is that a, a consistent segmentation should result in easier to reconstruct segments. Um, and they train the segmentation using policy gradient. Uh, so the way it looks is um, you, uh, you basically have an encoder um, that encodes uh, the, um, that encodes the words in the input uh, character by character, uh, et cetera. Um, and then you, uh, you segment these up, um, and then you get a single word, W-A-T, uh, another word, I-Z-I-T, uh, for what is it. And, um, and then you encode these uh, using a character level or phoneme level encoder. And um, then you have another recurrent neural network on top of it that takes these uh, as input. And then you have a reconstruction error at the end where, again, you generate these uh, one word at a time. Um, so this also, this method is also kind of nice because it's discrete decisions are just zero one decisions. So it's the kind of thing that you can kind of learn with, uh, learn more easily with reinforcement learning than, uh, than other things. Um, and the final one, this is also one of my papers. This is one that I'm, uh, it's pretty simple, but I'm kind of excited about this idea in general. 
Um, so all the previous work that I talked about in the um, in the previous uh, like all of the previous slides this time is trying to induce things on a sentence by sentence level. So for a particular sentence, you might find um, you might find a cluster uh, like part of speech tags or a tree structure. But can we learn about uh, the language in general? Um, so for example, um, and features of the language are called typology. Uh, so uh, what, what kind of type of language is it? Um, one example of typology is what is the canonical uh, word order of the language? Um, and we have a, a super simple method, which is train a neural machine translation system on 10,017 languages and then extract, uh, extract the representations. So the method is simple. Getting 10,017 languages worth of data is, uh, is not quite as simple, but um, we use the Bible for this, and the Bible is translated into many, many languages. Um, and then the idea is basically um, we, uh, we have two varieties of embeddings. One is we have a tag at the beginning of the, uh, we have a tag at the beginning of the sentence that tells what, uh, what language we're using. And then we also average all of the hidden states uh, for all of the words in the language from the encoder. And then we feed this average and this uh, language embedding into the typology classifier and classify. And this gives us uh, much better results than uh, um, kind of uh, simpler approaches while being relatively easy to use. Um, so I think uh, this method might be kind of interesting in itself, but it'd also be really interesting if we could find other ways to kind of extract holistic views of language um, as opposed to things for particular sentences. So I, I just view this as kind of the start, uh, and other people might have other ideas about how to do this. Yeah? Oh, with that paper, is yeah. it classifying into a set of discrete uh, like SVO, whatever. For yeah, um, it, it's basically multi, uh, multi-class, multi-label classification. So, uh, SVO, SOV, VSO uh, for word order typology, and then um, adjective before noun or after noun. Uh, and there's just a whole bunch of different typological features uh, that um, you know ling linguists have come up with in. Uh, the world atlas of linguistic structure and a whole bunch of other things. So the, there are places where you can get these. The reason why this is interesting is because those are um, extremely sparsely populated, even for walls. Um, most of the languages don't have annotations. Um, it would be more interesting if we could find even more fine-grained information. So like not just, uh, not just. What kind of like most yeah. function you to use that? So what kind of like the output? Oh, loss function? Yeah. So the loss function for training, we did kind of unsupervised training first where we, um, where we just trained using machine translation. So there the loss function is the log likelihood of the output or a negative log likelihood of the output. Um, for this, then we had a classification loss over the, uh, the labels that are candidate. Um, so it's actually, it's not complicated at all. You take an off the shelf neural MT system and run it and then you run a classifier, which is in scikit-learn or, or whatever else. So do you just fix it after doing MNT and then only train on classifier, or do you use it? We fix it after MT. Okay. Um, and that's like shared across thousands of languages? Yeah, the model, yeah. <laughs> so so okay. Google had a, a paper, right. Google and others had a paper where they trained over 10 languages. So we yeah, just so used like 100, <laughs> we used 100 times more. So. Well, what's the dimension of it's actually not that big, um, but yeah. uh, importantly, it's not that important for us to train a good neural MT system. It's okay. just more important to train a feature extractor. Like thousand neural and then like seven layers. Yeah, so we, we didn't do it that big. I think it might have even been single single layer or a thousand or something. Like but even for the different languages, you did it like them shared all the same. They all shared the the same data. Yeah. 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 Were the languages shared always? It was always to English. Actually, I realized later that we might, that might not have been the best idea. Um, it would have been better to train it in all directions because if you think about it, if you're going into English, you might drop some information that's not 
necessary for translating into English. So um, uh, apparently there were logistical issues about getting a like always aligned corpus. Um, they weren't major issues, so we probably should have just done it. Um, but uh, th this is what we did here. Um, yeah, any other questions about this or other things? Okay, if not, I'll, uh, I'll finish up here. Thanks.